22nd day, upper wind month, 1 CE, so, let me get this straight, Ida said. We were teleported here from the opposite side of the empire, then we were teleported back to the opposite side of the empire just so we could walk back here. That's right, Dame Verilin nodded. But, but. It was very convenient for Zushiru. Zushiru brought back twice as many goods. Nemel and her friends waited in line with Dame Verilin and Zushiro at the Death Bread branch in Wagner County's capital. The plaza around them was about as busy as she remembered it. Hundreds of humans went about their evening business, a mix of resident artisans, rural visitors and merchants from the Empire. A sprinkling of demi-humans could be seen as well. Goblins, ogres and trolls went between the shops and stands. Or operated them, in the case of a few. What she thought were harpies, she only knew about them from her army courses, gathered on the area of an official-looking building with a cute sign. Some reptilian beings stopped and turned to approach them. Nemel tensed and took a step back. The one in the lead was nearly as tall as a death knight. She was sure that if it bumped into her, it would break three or four of her bones. Or all of them. Yo, it said in a soft voice that didn't match its size. Long time no see. W.H. Who are you? Nemel asked. Uh, not you, the reptilian glanced at her. Dame Verilin. Who are you? Dame Verilin asked. The black-scaled reptilian blinked at her question. Ah, it's me, Dame Verilin. Kestrasi says? Don't be silly. You may smell like him, but Kestrasi says is 24 centimeters shorter than you are. I grew over the winter. I wasn't aware that lizardmen were a race that suddenly grew after reaching adulthood. We're not. Then you're not making any sense. Look, the lizard man's tail tapped on the pavement, it just happened. Lady Zaradnik said something about it being common for demi-human lords. I see. Well, that makes sense. What, just because Lady Zaradnik said so, you suddenly believe it? No, but it's common for demi-human lords to be larger than their fellows. If you've become a lizard man lord, then you would obviously grow larger. What Dame Verilin said was true, but it didn't make sense at the same time. Demi-human lords tended to be significantly larger than their followers, but why would someone get bigger just because they became a lord? By the way, Dame Verilin said. Does that mean you'll be dying soon? What? Kestris he says froze, his tail sticking straight out behind him. I see it all the time. A new demi-human lord appears and they pick fights with all the neighbors. I'm sorry to say that if you pick a fight with Lady Zaradnik, she'll have a new set of Lizardman leather accessories. She has an old set, who knows, Dame Verilin shrugged. Though our acquaintance has been brief, it's been nice knowing you, Chiefy says. Don't just kill me off like that. Tribes fight their neighbors because resources are scarce or they need to suppress the competition. The winter scale doesn't have to do any of that. The winter scale? Oh. My people sort of made up a name for our tribe on their own. The Winter Scale tribe is an officially recognized member of the Lizardman Alliance now. Nemel furrowed her brow over the unfamiliar topic. As Dame Verilin's seneschal, she needed to familiarize herself with the politics of the Sorceress Kingdom quickly. Unfortunately, Dame Verilin seemed to know little, or care at all, about the Sorceress Kingdom's politics. Nemel was Dame Verilin's vassal or minion, depending on whom one asked. Dame Verilin was Baroness Zirodnik's knight. Baroness Zirodnik was Lady Shultier's vassal. Lady Shultier was the Sorcerer King's direct vassal. Since Lady Zirodnik was Lady Shultier's vassal, that meant that Lady Shultier was a noble too. But Nemel had no idea what court rank Lady Shultier held. She only knew that the powerful vampire was the Sorcerer's Kingdom's Minister of Transportation. Minor nobles and their staff only needed to have vertical awareness in their own chain of fealty and know who was living nearby. Everything else tended to be pointless trivia as they would never interact with anyone aside from the aforementioned people. As far as her work went, she had to be especially wary of neighbors who might attack them since Lady Zaradnik's domain was one where people could eat other people. Nemel didn't know whether lizardmen ate humans or not, but it would be a problem if she had to deal with an alliance of lizardman tribes. I suppose that's why you're out here. Nah, the Lizardman Lord waved a claw. The Alliance meeting happened last week. I had to use the new transportation links to get there and it turned out to be pretty easy. These guys here with me are merchants that I'm showing around. I want them to set up a trade route between Warden's Vale and the Great Lake. Hmm, come to think of it, Dame Verilin said, 
You mentioned something about needing to thin out the fish farms by autumn. That's right, Kestris he says tail waved lazily. The merchants in Kolin Harbor, Erantel and this town all said they'd be interested in purchasing our fish. Some of my people are interested in what's being made back at the Great Lake. We're on our way to the western half of the duchy now to see what it's like there. Nemel let out a sigh of relief. If they had fish to sell, that probably meant they wouldn't come to raid Nemel's people for food. She was a war wizard, but she only had a handful of second-tier spells. Most of what she knew had to do with her work with the highway patrol. In that case, Dame Verilin said, I shan't keep you any further. We'll be heading out ourselves after picking up dinner here. Kestris Isses and the other lizardmen went on their way. Nemel shifted closer to Dame Verilin. Dame Verilin, how do you know that, gentlemen? He's one of Lady Zaradnik's vassals, the Frost Dragon in Snow Elf form replied. The chief of the Winter Scale tribe. How does that work in human terms? Is he a chief as in a village chief or does a tribal leader have court rank? He is the chief of a village, but, hmm? Wait, why do you have to make it a human thing? Because it's part of my job to know. If he's a part of Lady Zaradnik's court, then I'll have to interact with him at least semi-regularly. I need to know what sort of influence he has. How big is his domain? Around 200 square kilometers. What? In the empire, that much land would make Chief Isses account. It was twice as much land as House Gran had. Most of it is underwater, however. Huh? Nemel's thoughts jerked to a halt. What did it mean? Did it make him more powerful or less? No, they were talking about fish farms so should it just count as pasture for livestock? If it meant that they could farm all year round, it would give them a major advantage. Are you all right, Miss Gran? Well, let's try this another way. How many subjects does he have? Less than two hundred before winter. She felt herself relax. Even if his domain was large, he only had about as many subjects as a small village. That meant he was more like a village chief so not being introduced properly hadn't cost her much. Maybe their people would be similar since Nemel also only had a few migrants and a lot of land. They purchased dinner and returned to the warehouse district. There, Zushiru's cargo was being transferred to vehicles designed for transport within the Sorceress Kingdom. Nemel wandered over to where the migrants that she convinced to move to the Sorceress Kingdom with her from our winter were putting their things into a giant metal box ten meters long and tall enough to stand in. Dinner's here, everyone. A group came over to retrieve the bags from Nemel and her friends. In all, she managed to secure 100 people, all of them under the age of 17. None had families yet. Only 30 of them were present in the first wave of migrants. As she had suspected would be the case, all of her migrants were men. Unless they were utterly confident in their ability to personally secure their independence, women who came to the city tended to seek partners while they could, no matter their background. Those partners were usually well established, leaving an army of young bachelors with poor prospects and nowhere else to go. There were twenty woodcutters. Well, there were thirty woodcutters but ten of them claimed that they had experience hunting, foraging and trapping. Whether that made them rangers or not was yet to be seen. Since Dame Verilin said that her territory was completely wild, Nemel and her friends figured that it was the proper group to start with. Thanks, Lady Gran, one of the men said. Just Miss Gran now, Nemel said. Well, I was never Lady Gran, just Mistress Nemel. I don't get it. You said that there's land for ten villages, right? That's a barony, at least. Yes, but it's Dame Verilin's land and a knight can't promote barons. I'm just working as a seneschal for now. If one went by land area alone, it was a strange situation. Baroness Aradnik managed the territory of a marchioness. Dame Verilin had the territory of a powerful countess. The Lizardman chief was in a similar position. It was justified as those territories were mostly undeveloped frontier territories, but everyone was stuck because Lady Shiltier hadn't promoted Lady Zaradnik. Not that it was particularly bad, just awkward. Those not raised in human society probably thought nothing of it. The men finished packing, somehow only managing to fill half of the giant box with their five wagons worth of stuff. After that, they boarded covered passenger wagons with their dinner and departed west down the highway. Fendros, Elise and Ida screeched as they sped off. WW wait. Fendros gripped her seat, why are we going so fast? The ground speed limit here is only 40 kilometers an hour, 
Ilishnish said. 40. Ida's eyes widened, that's too fast. We're going to die if we hit something, Elise cried. We'll explode, Fendros said, humans aren't meant to travel this quickly. It was about the same as a hippogriff's cruising speed, so Nemel didn't think it was anything to panic over. A fly spell tops out at about 36 kilometers an hour, Nemel said. Weren't you planning to learn that? Not anymore, Ida said, this is crazy. Nemel stared at her friends, who were all simultaneously panicking while trying to hold their breaths for some reason. Imperial knights charge at 50 km per hour on horses, Nemel said. Ah the Imperial army doesn't explode on a regular basis. Her words fell on deaf ears. Nemel sighed and focused on her shepherd's pie instead. E. Rantful was roughly 50 km to the Imperial border and the town was about 10 km from the border, so they would arrive at the city in about an hour. A telltale nibbling sound rose from the seat behind her. Nemel turned to find Zushira munching on some sort of rock. Another green one? Nemel asked, you've been eating green rocks since you bought that whole wagon from our winter. I don't recall seeing any Quago eat green rocks before, Dame Verilin said. Don't come crying to me if you mutate. Nemel tried to imagine a giant rodent person mutating after eating green rocks, but her imagination was deficient. Quago a mutate if they eat different colored rocks? She asked. Sort of, Dame Verilin replied. When they're young, the ores they feed on determine adult traits such as the quality of their fur. Will not change when already adult, Zushiru swallowed. Zushiru thinks the flavor will be popular. What does it taste like? Copper, with. Some garbled noises came out of Zushiru's mouth. It appeared that humans had no concept of the flavor he was describing. But isn't copper expensive? The metal was used for a variety of industrial applications. Sheets of pure copper were also employed as lining for rooms to thwart attempts at divination. Nemel watched the fields roll by the window. Roughly half of the land appeared to be pasture. She supposed that was how the city fed its demi-human citizens. It was too early in the season to tell what they were growing on the rest of the land with how fast they were going. Eventually, the walls of Erantel came into view. Instead of heading to the city, they turned south at a large crossroads. Another set of walls could be seen in the distance ahead. There's another city? Fendros said. That's Colin Harbor, Dame Verilin replied. A town. But it's as large as that city just now. Half as large. It's a half circle with the river on the south side. Still, Fendros frowned, it's too big to be a town. Nemel nodded in agreement. Towns were generally compact so land for rural industry wasn't needlessly taken up. Well, you'll see why it's so large, Dame Verilin said. Their procession slowed down as they approached a brightly lit gate. The road within was just as well illuminated, and the quality of the thoroughfare put the proud streets of our winter to shame. Nemel stared out the window of their cabin. The first stretch of road was canyon-like, with something built on the earthworks five meters above them. They crossed under a bridge then passed another level of the town. She could only get short peaks of the bustling urban plazas before their vehicles turned onto a ramp and headed down to yet another section of the town. A huge harbor district stretched out before them, glowing in the evening light. This is nothing like Elanel, Ida said, or any other imperial harbor. The first thing that she noted was that the place was scoured clean. Everything was laid over with smooth stone pavement and none of the unsavory odors that usually accompanied a waterfront could be detected. The warehouses were spotless and well maintained, the lanes between them well lit. Rather than the dingy ports of the Empire, the entirety of the harbor felt even more pristine and secure than our winter's first-class district. Occasional patrols of Death Series servitors and Elder Liches reinforced that notion. They stopped in the middle of an open lot. Nemel got out just in time to watch Zushiru's cargo get hauled off into a covered yard filled with similar containers. I thought your operations were in Erantel, Nemel said. They are, the Quago a merchant said. But storage in Colin Harbor is one-tenth of the cost of storage in Erantel. Transport is also cheap, so Zushiru replenishes inventories from here. That probably made sense. It was something far more feasible in the Sorceress Kingdom than in the Empire. She looked south across the harbor at the huge fortress built on an island in the river, its brilliant limestone walls painted bright orange by the setting sun. The local noble, 
or at least the nobles' court, had foreseen the change that the sorcerous kingdom would bring and chartered a town specifically designed to see to the country's future needs. The harbour master's office is this way, Miss Gran, Zushiru said. You will need to book passage and hold space for your trip tomorrow. She followed Zushiru to a stone building with a sailing ship on its sign, finding that the harbour master was a vampire bride. After reserving space on a ship for the following morning, she came back out with the Quago a merchant to join the others. What now? Nemel asked. Public transport to Irantal is at the town level, Dame Verilin said. You can find accommodations here for everyone, as well. They followed Dame Verilin back up the ramp that their wagons have come down, returning to the plaza that they had seen from the highway. Nemel observed the goings-on as they slowly made their way along busy lanes filled with people. Are you sure this isn't a city? Fendros said, it feels like one. Towns were busy on market days, but they were nothing like this. The atmosphere was filled with the same energy as one might find in the markets of our winter's second-class districts. There was more to that, however. Colin Harbour had a distinct character that she had never seen or felt anywhere else. Is that a temple? Elise asked, it's bigger than most city temples, and look at how many people are attending. Maybe it's because. Fendros snapped her mouth shut. A group of undead walked by. There were two types Nemel had never seen before. Both were lightly armored, one in black robes and the other in dark leather. The robe type wielded an old deadwood staff, but it didn't look like an elder lich. The other had a pair of wickedly curved daggers gripped in each fist. There were two of the latter walking ahead of the group, their crimson gazes looking out intensely over the crowds as they marched along. In a way, they reminded her of the two scouts in every Imperial patrol, but their movements didn't convey any sense of stealth. Once they passed, Nemel's gaze returned to the complex on the western end of the plaza. It might have been natural to conclude that the temple was so busy due to the presence of the undead, but Nemel was sure it wasn't the case. No one looked scared, they didn't even move away from the Soul Eaters or undead patrols. As they came closer, the details of the temple became clear. A temple of the six, Elise frowned. It's not just a temple, Ida's gaze went to the buildings nearby. It's, a campus? Theocracy script was carved into the stone of one of the main buildings. Harbour University. Nemel read the name out loud. But what's the theocracy doing here? Elise asked. This place wasn't built by the theocracy, Dame Verilin answered. All of Colin Harbour was chartered by Countess Colin. I thought the Sorceress Kingdom adopted the laws of Reistais, Fendros said. Why is a noble involving herself so deeply with the temples? Who knows? Dame Verilin shrugged, I suppose you should ask her if you really want to know. Nope. Random science of random minor nobles did not come up randomly to ask random questions of high nobles. Especially high nobles who could charter city-like towns and ridiculously gigantic castles. A pair of fair blonde men clad in shining mithril plate armor walked past them, followed by a man and woman in steel plate. Following the four were a dozen armed and armored children chatting animatedly between themselves. All of them wore black tabards with silver trim. They disappeared into the front entrance of the university. Sir Sana worshippers, Elise shuddered. But what were they doing with those kids? Ida asked. They're acolytes and squires, Dame Verilin told them. I recognized about half of them from the last time I wandered around here. The adults in Mithrael armor are paladins. The other ones are clerics. Another group of paladins, clerics and their apprentices walked by to enter the building. Nemel glanced at the undead patrols and sentries nearby. Why did a country ruled by an undead sovereign have a temple university? Why were they training so many new clerics and paladins? This doesn't make any sense, Elise frowned. The temples are flourishing here. In a country ruled by the undead. Isn't Lady Shultir a cleric? Fendros said, never mind human temples raising clerics and paladins, you have powerful undead clerics running around. She had a point. The idea of an undead cleric felt wrong, but it might be that what they saw as normal was wrong. It certainly wasn't normal here. Nemel looked around the plaza again. Maybe there were undead paladins walking around, too. They crossed the plaza to rent rooms at a local merchant inn for everyone. Dame Verilin whined as usual over having to pay for everything. I had better make this all back in taxes, she muttered. Whoever heard of a dragon paying to support her minions? It shouldn't take long, Nemel told her. 
The accommodations here are cheaper than in the Empire. You'll get everything back and more with this season's revenues alone. Are you sure about that? You didn't spend that much. We stopped in Angelfort for one night and you made us camp out all of the other days. As wealthy as she was, Dame Verilin wasn't very open-handed. At least that part of the legends about dragons seemed to be true. Nemel couldn't make any guarantees, but she was reasonably certain about her assertion over taxes. The first season, probably the whole year, would be taken up clearing land for the first village. They would be cutting down trees and selling them. There wasn't much room to go wrong there. Once they put their things away and made sure everyone was settled, Nemel went back outside with Fendros, Elise and Idaho Zushiro was going home to e Rantel with his apprentices and Dame Verilin had some people to see too. It was a good opportunity to take a look at the city before they got themselves stuck out in the wilderness. They returned to the highway and boarded a passenger wagon sporting a plaque with e Rantel, Call in Harbor written on it. Several seats in the cabin were already occupied. Nemel sat down beside a young woman in the uniform of the Merchant Guild. Good evening, Nemel smiled. The woman looked up from the documents on her lap. Good evening. Hmm, from the Empire? That's right. We're here to stay, though. Nemel Gran, by the way. Edwina Hoffman, the woman replied. Merchant traffic from the Empire is mostly back to normal, but you're the first migrant that I've heard of. Human migrant, at any rate. I was offered a management position, Nemel said. It was more attractive than what I had going in the Empire, so here I am. Edwina Hoffman nodded knowingly. I see. There's a severe labor shortage here, so that's not surprising. There is? I thought the undead did a lot of the work. Menial labor, yes, Miss Hoffman said. What everyone is looking for is skilled labor. The majority of the population in the duchy works in rural industries and most of them are illiterate. The Sorceress Kingdom produces so many raw materials and we don't have the skilled labor to process it all. Some people joke that we've become a giant village, most of our exports are what you'd get from the countryside because we can't process them into manufactured goods. We import everything that we can't make enough of. Well, the territory was just annexed last year. Oh, we realize that. It's just, well, you'll understand once you've been here for a while. This isn't some sleepy pastoral realm frozen in time anymore. Everything is moving. There's something new every season. New ideas. New technology. New ways of seeing the world. We need more artisans, administrators, school teachers, engineers, all sorts of specialists to create our new reality. It's an exciting time to be alive. Even for a city girl like Nemel, Miss Hoffman's energy felt stifling. Nemel could understand what she was saying, however. Every human nation in the region was an agrarian state and the strength of each nation's economy, and thus its power to do everything else, was dictated by available labor. It had been that way for as long as anyone could remember. How to optimize that labor was part of the Imperial Magic Academy's curriculum. There were even advanced classes in the Imperial Universities that experimented with golems, summons and various creatures in an attempt to harness their power for economic gain. Rumor had it that the undead were not overlooked as a part of those studies, but no evidence that the Empire was experimenting with undead labor could be found. With how the faith of the four was, the temples would certainly raise a stink the moment they sensed that the rumor had any truth to it. The Sorceress Kingdom, however, had no such qualms about the undead and now they had the manpower to spare. The problem was that one couldn't simply put a farmer in front of a lathe and tell them that they were now a machinist. Every vocation, including farming, required upward of a decade to produce masters at the standards of the guilds. Even if they had the resources to spare to invest that time, there weren't remotely enough master artisans to train hundreds of thousands of people in new trades. Nemel wondered how she would fare with Dame Verilin's territory. On one hand, they were starting from scratch. On the other hand, they had set things up so they could tap into the spares from her parents' territory. House Grand being well liked and respected by its subjects went a long way toward convincing people to come to the Sorcerer's Kingdom. So what are you doing so late in the evening? Nemel asked. Late? Hmm, I suppose that would be true a year ago. With how secure the Sorcerer's Kingdom is and how easy it is to get around, even that part has changed. Miss Hoffman picked up the documents in her lap and waved them lightly in front of her. Updated accounts and paperwork from the Call in Harbor Merchant Guild. Back in the day, 
We'd have someone go out once a week to the nearest towns in the duchy to transfer documents. Took one day going there and another coming back. Now, you can jump in a wagon, have dinner on the way and be back in less than two hours. Information flows quickly here. Even rural villages that used to only have news come in once a season can be pretty up to date on things. He, is that so? Yup, Miss Hoffman nodded. Coming to town has become a regular thing. A lot of those people that you saw filling the plazas in Colin Harbour are actually from the villages in the baronies nearby. Young people, especially. They just hop in the village wagon and go out to town after work. Everyone knows that Countess Colin is a genius, but I don't think they understand just how much of a genius she is. What do you mean? They started building this place a year ago, but, even then, Countess Colin saw what was coming. Her towns are all like this. They all purposely showcase the new things that the Sorceress Kingdom brings. Tens of thousands of people come to these towns every week and they go home with visions of the future in their heads. There's just layers and layers of stuff that she's planned in advance and it all catapults everyone forward. Nemel was still stuck trying to understand how the town was built so quickly. Did that mean the castle was new, too? Was Countess Corlin even human? Anyway, Miss Hoffman said, enough about that. What about you? Me? Nemel blinked, uh, I just wanted to see the city before going to Warden's Vale. I came with the other people here. Miss Hoffman turned to look over her shoulder. Oh, if it isn't Master Sheru. She smiled brightly. Hello, Miss Hoffman, the Quago merchant waved a claw. So you're finally back from the Empire. How did it go? Zhu Sheru thinks that it could have gone better. The merchant part was good but the part where Zushiru was kidnapped by assassins was not so good. Ah, well, Miss Hoffman said. Merchants just have it rough sometimes. Where are you headed next? Our winter had monumental architecture aplenty, but there weren't ten meter tall statues of any emperors in the city. Erantel had two statues of its reigning sovereign standing on either side of its southern gate. Nemel wasn't sure what to think of them. Fendros, Elise and Ida silently stared up from the nearby wagon lot, as if harboring the same sentiment. Is, is that the Sorcerer King? Ida asked. I think so. Elise answered, but all I can see are the feet and the face. They're sort of scary. Someone had made an effort to illuminate the statues so people could make out the details at night, but, due to the exquisitely realistic way that the robes flowed around the figures, the lighting at ground level cut off around the knees. There were magic lights in the eye sockets of each statue's skull, supposedly done in an approximation of an undead being's crimson gaze. The light painted the inside of each cowl, casting both skeletal visages in a garish red glow. And maybe it looks better during the day, Nemel said as they walked between the statues. Look, there are even flowers piled up around their feet. They were suitably monstrous piles of flowers for the monstrously huge statues. At least they weren't piles of bones. Do you think we'll see him in person? Elise asked. You're kidding, right? Fendro said, I've only seen the Emperor once, and that was during a parade. The Sorcerer King is even more powerful than the Emperor, there's no chance we'll be able to see him in person. That's right, Nemel said, we're pretty much nobodies here. There's no way. There is, Dame Verilin said. Nemel turned her head to look up at her liege. There is? I've heard that the Sorcerer King regularly walks around the city. Maybe he's doing it right now. A lump formed in the pit of Nemel's stomach. She wasn't ready to meet the undead magic caster who had single-handedly crushed the royal army of Rhea's ties. What do we do if we see his majesty? Who knows, Dame Verilin shrugged, I've not met his majesty myself. Nemel looked past the gate, but she didn't see any ten meter tall undead casters stomping up and down the street. The customs officials let them through after asking a few questions, offering a warm welcome to the Sorceress Kingdom. Past the outer gate was a large section of warehouses between the first and second walls. They passed between a pair of death knights and the next gate, which led to a more city-looking part of the city. As with the border town and Colin Harbour, the streets were brightly lit. Unlike those towns, the city of Virantal felt more like a settlement that belonged to the region. Winding streets lined with wattle and daub houses were frequented by a familiar mix of human residents and wagons. Since all of the wagons appeared to be using soliters, however, the ever-present scent of horse manure that cities and towns in the empire had was absent. 
After seeing those last two towns, Ida said. I thought Erantel would be even crazier. Crazier? Nemel frowned. Yeah, like with flying citadels that they talk about them having down south or something. This all looks, um, normal? It's not as if the Sorcerer's Kingdom built the city, Fendrose told her. Humans did. Of course it would look like a human city. There were signs of restructuring being done in the city, however. As they made their way deeper in, they saw stretches of roadwork being done by dwarves directing teams of skeletons. It was probably as much as they could manage without tearing everything down and rebuilding it. They zigzagged back and forth in a northeasterly direction, eventually coming to the gate of a dividing wall. Nemel's steps slowed as she stared at the pitch-dark void beyond. Dame Verilin, she asked, what's in there? It's Erantel's demi-human quarter, Dame Verilin replied. There's a way up into the aviary there, as well. Nemel reached out and grabbed Dame Verilin's hand. Fendros took Nemel's hand, Elise took Fendros hand and Ida took Elise's hand. Nemel's eyes darted about as they proceeded forward and the darkness swallowed them. It's not that dark, Dame Verilin said. How do you know that? Nemel furrowed her brow, you have perfect night vision. It turned out that it wasn't actually that dark. After her eyes adjusted, she found that the main thoroughfare was lined with softer lights. Every type of demi-human she had ever seen in her life and more moved about the streets, so she refused to let go of Dame Verilin's hand. Hmm, he's not in, Dame Verilin murmured. Who? Master Tian. He runs a dojo nearby, but nothing is moving inside. They went further into the quarter, walking down a ramp to pass through a terraced market. Dozens of unfamiliar sights, scents and sounds assailed Nemel from every direction. Save for a handful of dwarves and humans, all of the merchants running the stands and the people browsing them were demi-humans. She couldn't tell what half of anything being sold was for. Five minutes later, they came to a cavernous opening that went down into the ground. A steady stream of demi-humans came and went. Then joined the flow of bodies to make their descent. Where are we going now? Nemel asked. Zusharu's place, Dame Verilin answered. Most of the demi-human quarter is underground. Once I see him home safely, my task will be complete. What were you in the Empire for, now that this is all over? Fendros asked. I told you what I was there for. Be but that was just a cover, right? Fendros said, you must have had some other super secret objective. Not that I can recall. I was told to find some spies on top of what I was already doing, but that was it. Fendros being Fendros, Nemel was certain that her friend was in no way convinced. Countries didn't usually dispatch powerful dragons to investigate domestic industries, markets, and infrastructure and advertise the Adventurer Guild. Actually, countries didn't usually dispatch powerful dragons at all. The air grew warmer the further they descended. Strange, glowing mushrooms replaced the magical lighting, washing the wide tunnel in a half-dozen fluorescent shades. Nemel's only sense of how deep they were was the slowly growing feeling that they were being pressed down upon by the earth above. Zusharu stopped at an alcove ringed by purple, green and yellow fungus. He wiped his feet on a mat before opening the door further in. Sister? Shiru is back. A quago ahead popped out from a side room. Brother? Everyone, Shiru is back. The scratching of clawed feet echoed from within. Six more quagoa came out into the hallway. Husband. 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 Eh? Zushiru took a step backward. Nemel's lip curled downward. Rejoice brother. Zushiru's sister said, many new litters come. But, your sister braved the world above to purchase the right to expand our warren from the undead. It was expensive, but there was plenty of money in your merchant guild account. The best tours were ordered from our old home. Your children will grow healthy and strong with the sleekest of coats. It is good that you made so much while you were away. Nemel had been around the Quago long enough to see that the females filling the hallway were tremendously proud of Zushiru. We went to see Director Ralpha from the Azure Sky, Iron Fist Sector put together an education plan for them. The cost of tuition was high, but your children will be the wisest of the next generation. Also, your wives have purchased adornments suitable for the consorts of the greatest Quago emergent. Master artisans work day and night, fashioning clothing and jewelry that will not bring shame to the name of Zushiru. 
Zhu Shiru's eyes went from wife to wife, nose and whiskers twitching. Nemal wondered which one of them was the beautiful wife that his apprentices gushed over. After a long moment, the Quagoa merchant wordlessly turned around and shuffled back out of his home. Where are you going? Dame Verilin asked. Zushiru must return to work. The Quagoa merchant turned around and disappeared into the crowd. Nemal exchanged looks with her friends. Was what happened a good thing? A bad thing? She had no idea how Quagoa families were supposed to function. Well, Dame Verilin said, that was interesting. Let's head to the aviary. Aren't you angry? Fendros asked. Angry about what? Zushiru went and got all those women pregnant. I thought you were supposed to be the wife. Dame Verilin tilted her head curiously. I have no idea what you're thinking. Why should it matter to me how many children he is with other women? How do frost dragon families work? We deposit our eggs on glaciers and icebergs, Dame Verilin said. The more plentiful the area, the better. Food, as Nemel had come to realize, did not just mean wild animals. It included people, too. Dame Verilin's world was not the same as the agrarian little that Nemel had been raised in, despite how civil she seemed. So you don't take care of your children at all? Ida asked. Not usually, Dame Verilin answered. We're born with everything we need to take care of ourselves. In general, dragons can go all the way to adulthood without seeing another dragon and be perfectly fine. Speaking of which, I'd like to head to the aviary now. What are we doing there? Visiting my family. For someone who claimed that frost dragons didn't care much for family, Dame Verilin seemed quite intent on seeing them. To Nemel's surprise, they didn't go back up the way they came, instead continuing going further into the colorful tunnel spiraling deeper under the city. Eventually, they came to a stone storefront that was, curiously, similar to what one might find on the streets above. They entered and found themselves in a warmly lit tavern with patrons from several different races. The proprietors of the establishment were dwarves. What's this place? Nemel asked. It's the Frosty Beard, Dame Verilin said. The first business established in Erantel's demi-human quarter. This way. The aroma of hearty meals and strong liquor suffused the air as they went along the side of the tavern. Dame Verilin led them up a stone stairwell, which went up through several floors worth of corridors lined with accommodations. Near the top of the stairs, they came out into another tavern with a different set of patrons from the one below. Upon leaving the building, they found themselves back on the surface. Not far from the tavern was a large office with an attached warehouse. Across from the office was some sort of walled complex. The sign near the gate read as your sky, Iron Fist Institute for Promising Young Children. Nemel and her friends cast curious looks at the scenery beyond the gate. It's the orphanage run by Director Alpha, Dame Verilin explained. Isn't it too big for an orphanage? Ida asked. Charity was limited, so most charitable organizations tried to stretch their budgets as much as possible to help as many people as possible. Even temple orphanages used low-cost housing that consisted of simple longhouses with shared living and sleeping areas. Food was similarly on a tight budget. Education suited the orphanage owner's purposes. Temple orphanages, for instance, usually trained children to be members of the temple staff. There are a lot of orphans, Dame Verilin said. Mostly humans. In addition to dormitories for its occupants, the orphanage houses a primary school, a library and several other facilities meant to teach the orphans life skills. Where do the orphans go after they grow up? Fendros asked. I have no idea, Dame Verilin answered. I can only assume that they are dispatched to pay off whatever costs they incurred for their upbringing. Maybe Director Alpha collects taxes from her carefully cultivated products? Orphans aren't products, Nemel frowned. And not everything is about taxes. They should be. Taxes are wonderful. You should see all the schemes that Lady Zaradnik has come up with for her own carefully cultivated products. That's. Technically, Dame Verilin probably wasn't wrong, but it sounded terrible. A noble was tasked with managing their domain, which included its people and their productivity. Nemel didn't know anyone who viewed their subjects as carefully cultivated products, however. You can't talk about your people like that, Nemel said. They're all vassals under your care and you should be good to them. Her liege cast a dubious look at her. Whenever humans talk like that, she said, it always ends up as something expensive or some sort of impractical nonsense. 
It's not impractical nonsense, Nemo replied. You're, you're not going to do mean things to your new subjects, are you? I thought that was your job. It is. No, wait. It's my job to help manage your land. I'm not going to do anything mean to anyone. If you say so, you can do anything you wish so long as I get my taxes. Well, there are some things that I won't tolerate, but you should already know what those are. As a frost dragon, Dame Verilin wanted to keep her domain, or rather, her domain dash mostly natural. Not only was it to be kept mostly natural, but the natural balance had to be preserved. Land was set aside for human type settlement, but it was a small percentage of her holdings. Activities like hunting and logging had to be kept sustainable. Any industries that they developed couldn't be detrimental to the natural state of her territory. Nemel would have her potato villages. They could also glean some of the natural bounty from their surroundings. Beyond that, they couldn't think of what else they could do. According to Dame Verilin, Baroness Saradnik had a similar policy for development. Hopefully, they could get some ideas from her. They walked into the office across from the orphanage, which turned out to be a processing center for the Sorceress Kingdom's vampire post. Two of the namesake vampires were interacting with a small line of customers while another was in the warehouse sorting out parcels. Dame Verilin, the vampire bride in the warehouse said, You're back. Who are these young women? They're my new minions, Dame Verilin smiled. Minions? I don't recall collecting minions as being a part of your assignment. It wasn't, but no one said that I couldn't. Anyway, they're mine now. You can't have them. Dame Verilin stuck up her nose. As an elf, it looked incredibly haughty. The vampire bride ran its crimson gaze over Nemel and her friends. Are they authorized to be in here? Authorized? This is a government office. Members of the general public can't simply go in and out. But they're my minions. Look, no one ever questions why you're allowed to go everywhere while accompanying Lady Schultier. MMH. The vampire bride went to confer with the two others in the front. Nemel felt guilty over delaying the post office's queue. A minute later, the vampire bride came back. Why are you here? She asked. To see my family, of course, Dame Verilin answered. Is it necessary for these humans to accompany you? They're the entire reason why I'm going. The post office worker crossed her arms, raising a hand to tap her lower lip with a manicured finger. This is highly irregular. I don't see why it is. If Lady Zaradnik is Lady Shiltier's vassal and I'm Lady Zaradnik's vassal, then my vassals are also under Lady Shiltier. We all work for Lady Shiltier. That's not going to work at all. Just because someone was a vassal didn't mean they gained all of the rights and privileges of their liege. Well, all right, the vampire bride said. Huh? Dame Verilin ushered them up a flight of stairs that grew more frozen the higher they went. The top was completely iced over and they found themselves in front of a huge structure straddling e rantles in a wall. Like the wall, the entire building was covered in layers of ice and rime. They followed a black carpet into the structure's wide entrance. Aside from its size, it had the feel of a regular hallway. Doors lined the outer wall and an odor similar to Dame Verilin's, which was a distinct lack of one if that made any sense, filled the air. Mother. Dame Verilin called out, Mother? I'm back. The door in front of them opened. A frost dragon nearly twice as long as Dame Verilin looked out from inside. Welcome back, dear, the dragon said in a decidedly motherly tone. The time you've been away, Jem, it feels like one of your usual wanderings. How was the empire? It was very human, Dame Verilin replied. I did end up collecting a lot of treasure, though. Also, Dame Verilin grandly swept out her hand towards Nemel. I have minions now. The elder dragon gasped. Her head shot forward faster than Nemo could blink, stopping ten centimeters from her face. Really? A nostril threatened to suck in Nemo's head, these are your minions? Indeed, Dame Verilin said proudly, my very first minions. The one you're sniffing right now is Nemo. Down the line from her are Fendros, Elise, and Idaho everyone, this is my mother, Kalistran equals Din Shashua. Nemo offered an awkward curtsy trying not to stare at the fangs in front of her. Pleased to meet you, my lady. We've been in your daughter's care. Oh my, how polite. Everyone, come look. My dear Elishnish is back and she has minions. Several doors in the hallway opened. The same number of frost dragon heads popped out. That can't be right, 
a frost dragon with a single alabaster horn said. Ilishnish is barely a century old. That's right, another, smaller frost dragon said. How can it be possible? Maybe if they were goblins, but those are humans. Kalistran only seemed to grow more proud with every comment. I told you my methods of rearing weren't wrong, she said. Gah, if only Mianuinia wasn't out on deliveries. I'd make her eat all of her sanctimonious drivel about raw strength being the only thing that matters. Human mothers often bragged about their children. Nemel never imagined that dragons would as well. Say, another frost dragon asked, why are they all young human females? They're not just young human females, Ilishnish answered, they're human lords. Young female human lords, that's a red dragon thing, though. Legends said that red dragons savored the flesh of young maidens. More often than not, those tales would involve beautiful princesses. She had always dismissed it as a fanciful attribution, why would something specifically target young maidens, after all, but maybe it was true. I'm not going to eat them, Dame Verilin said. Human lords manage land, so I'll be having them manage my mountain. The frost dragon shook its massive head. There you go with your crazy ideas again. First singing, then dancing, now some strange human idea. Nature sees to itself, you don't need anyone to manage it. I swear you and Hedginmo will become more deviant by the season. That might be true for Hedginmo, but I'm not a deviant. Where is he, by the way? Work, Kilistran said. There's a new route to the southwest. I believe everyone else has been familiarized with it already. I hope they don't expect me to start deliveries right away, Dame Verilin said. I've been working non-stop for months. Maybe they'll let me sleep for a year or two. Actually, I should leave before they find something for me to do. Dame Verilin said her farewells and left the aviary. She made Nemel and Fendro's cast fly on everyone so they wouldn't have to go back through the post office. They landed in the city's central district and left out of its southern gate. Your mother seems like a nice person, Nemel said. Is that so? Dame Verilin replied, well, I suppose she tried to raise us in our decidedly unfrost dragon y circumstances, but, beyond that, I don't think she's particularly nice. I'd say my father was one of the nicer ones in our little enclave. Didn't your father want to wipe out the frost giants? He subjugated the Quagua and you said he did all sorts of mean things to you, too. Yes, that's right. Nemel sincerely hoped that Dame Verilin would stay as nice as she was. Not that she was particularly nice, but she was generally straightforward and didn't go out of her way to do mean things. Frost dragons were supposed to be pretty evil, but her new liege was a lot more civil than most of the people Nemel had encountered. They passed through the main plaza of E. Rantel, which was still busy despite the late hour. Do we need to buy anything from here? Elise asked, it'll be a long time before we see the city again, right? Now that they were in the Sorceress Kingdom, the idea that they would be out on a wild frontier became more real. Endless worries over forgotten necessities and whether she was ready to become a goblin chief plagued her thoughts. We've checked over our things three dozen times already, Fendros answered. I'd be shocked if we found out we were missing something. Didn't Nemel book passage before dawn tomorrow? Ida yawned, we should get back to our room soon or we're going to be dead on our feet tomorrow. They returned to Quallin Harbor without any argument. A day of travel might have been simple to shrug off, but their week-long journey from our winter had worn all of them thin. Their destination was another hundred kilometers upriver from Quallin Harbor, but ships were generally much faster than wagons and could sail all day and night. Committing critical blunders due to fatigue as soon as she took up her station wouldn't be the best of starts. Before the sun rose the next morning, everyone gathered at the berth where their ship was due to arrive. Nemel bought breakfast for everyone at the local death bread and they ate while chatting amongst themselves. A wagon conveying the container with their belongings was parked nearby. I hadn't noticed before, Ida said, but this harbor is above the river, isn't it? Nemel peered south, but the morning mist obscured anything beyond a hundred meters. She looked down at the water of the harbor. That's probably true. The water here isn't flowing. The Katza River has seasonal floods, a vampire bride in a blue-gray uniform said. The harbor is several meters above the river for that reason. A pair of locks at each end of the harbor allow entry. A sense of relief came with a normal-sounding explanation. The Empire had several river networks that employed locks to bypass unnavigable stretches of waterway. Flood control was also a crucial element in provincial management. 
With the sorceress kingdom being as ridiculous as it was, she had grown to expect some equally ridiculous answer to every mundane problem. Several minutes later, a barge appeared out of the fog to the west. It rode a bit higher in the water than a river barge in the Empire, but the design seemed familiar enough. What was strange about it, however, was that its hull was fashioned entirely out of steel. After a moment, she looked up and realized that the barge also had no sails. Nemo leaned back and forth, trying to figure out how it worked. Are there soul eaters pulling it around? She asked. Barges were sometimes assisted by draft animals on the shore. Since the undead didn't need to breathe, they could be underwater. There were proposals for that early on, the vampire bride answered, but it was quickly deemed unfeasible for deep water. The undead moving the ship are inside the vessel. Maybe there was something like a water wheel hidden out of sight. The Imperial Army's Corps of Engineers occasionally made proposals for golems to be used as a motive force for all manner of machinery, but the cost of development and production was exorbitantly high. The barge silently glided to a stop under a gurney crane at the berth. Some sort of metal frame was lowered and it disappeared into the ship's hold. A minute later, a container identical to theirs was lifted out of the barge and lowered into an empty lot. Two more containers joined the first before their container was loaded onto the ship. The vampire bride gestured to them. You may board now, she said. Eh? It's already ready to go? The vessel will depart in ten minutes. An elder lich floated down from the deck, exchanging documents with the vampire bride. Nemal instructed her settlers to board the barge, counting heads as they went up a flight of portable stairs. After confirming that no one was missing, she went up the steps and found herself staring at a mostly featureless deck. Her people wandered around, looking over the edges and into the hold. They avoided a structure in the back where a death knight was staring out at them from behind the helm. This barge is so big, Elise said, but we're the only cargo. The companies in Elenal would go into fits over all of this empty hold space, Ida agreed. It's to be expected, isn't it? Fendro said, Warden's Veil is out on the frontier. They wouldn't move the same amount of freight around as a developed territory. River transport was generally so efficient that even developed territories only saw delays in transport during seasonal harvests. Trade between cities would have been as Fendros had mentioned. Going by the sheer lack of cargo, Nemel estimated that there couldn't be that many people in Baroness Zaradnik's territory. She couldn't see what was in the offloaded containers, but, if she were to guess, it was probably all raw materials. The ship spell sounded and they drifted away from their berth. Nemel looked over the railing watching the water churn quietly near the rear of the vessel. She still couldn't figure out what was moving them around. They entered a lock on the eastern end of the harbor, which lowered them to river level. After clearing the lock and turning westward, the ship picked up speed to about what good, steady winds would give a sail barge. How long will it be until we arrive? Ida brushed back a lock of blonde hair from her face. The harbor master's office said no more than five hours, Nemel said. Doesn't that mean we can go back and forth from Erantel in a day? Elise furrowed her brow, I thought we would be stuck out in the middle of nowhere with nothing nearby. Our place isn't in Warden's Vale, Nemel said. It's somewhere further along, Dame Verilin. If one follows the river, Dame Verilin said, it's about 40 kilometers further upstream. It's on the far side of the river, as well. Nemel eyed the cat's a river. The shores were so far apart that she couldn't make out anything smaller than buildings, vineyards and orchards on either side. So it's six hours to Erantel from Warden's Vale, Elise murmured, but once we get to our place, we're stuck? Nemel and I have fly, Fendros said. So it shouldn't be that bad. A river like this should have smaller boats, as well. But if we have to evacuate for some reason, Ida said, it's going to be bad. Why would you need to evacuate? Dame Verilin frowned. Because, Lady Zaradnik allows people to eat other people in her territory, right? Ogres or something might raid us. Nonsense, Dame Verilin scoffed. Humans might be stupid enough to encroach on a dragon's domain, but tribal demi-humans aren't. If you properly mark your territory so predatory beasts stay away, you can probably sleep out in the open and nothing will eat you aside from flies and mosquitoes. How do we properly mark out our territory? Nemel asked. I don't know how humans do it, Dame Verilin answered, but you can probably leave scent markers like everyone else. Scent markers? Like dogs in the cities. Urinating on building corners and trees and such. 
They stared at Dame Verilin. Nemel imagined herself with her skirts hiked up around her waist, desperately trying to pee everywhere so she wouldn't get eaten. How much water would she have to drink? How often would she need to do it? Dame Verilin yawned and stretched, walking out onto a clear section of the deck. Then she transformed into a dragon. The settlers around the ship started and fled to the bow. Nemel ran over to calm them down. Don't worry, everyone, she said. That's Dame Verilin. That ain't no Dame Verilin. It is. I told you all before, right? We thought you meant some other kind of dragon. What other kind of dragon was there? Nemel turned around. Dame Verilin, that's dangerous. What if something happened to the ship? Such as? Sinking? You're a dragon, you know. Of course I know. Dame Verilin's tail flicked from side to side, you small people always have a horrible sense for size and mass. I only weigh about one ton. That box you filled is far heavier than I am. This ship can carry multiple boxes. Do you really think that a cute little frost dragon like me will do anything? Dame Verilin spread her wings while muttering to herself, lifting off the deck with a single, powerful flap. She hovered in place and alighted on top of the structure at the rear of the vessel, folding her wings and curling up on herself. Wake me up when we get home, she said, 